First of all, I'd like to say um, thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, we have today uh, Her Excellency Razan Khalif Al Mubarak, who is the managing director at the Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. Uh, I just want to say that that film was absolutely superb. So congratulations to you and your team uh, and to Image Nation, because I was really, really impressed. Uh, beautifully, beautifully edited and beautifully narrated. Um, this is our second in uh, second uh, discussion in uh, partnership with Image Nation. Um, and you know, we're obviously representing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and we were looking at them, these uh, documentaries as a form of also public diplomacy, uh, still in its experimental stages. Uh, Razan, could you tell us how is it that you got involved in this whole field in the first place? Because I know you're not just about conservation of species, you're also much more broadly interested in the environment and ecology. Um, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Great, great to see you, albeit virtually. And thank you for those who are uh, attending this uh, virtual session, and I hope that you've all enjoyed the film. And uh, I'm happy to know that we've made it from an environmental or conservation perspective on the list of topics that are now recognized as important issues that can be sort of categorized as very critical in uh, in your role, uh, Your Excellency Omar, as as, an, as a previous ambassador, and um, as our um, um, you know engaging on the issues of cultural diplomacy. I've always felt that you know our work in conservation and in, and our work in environment you know do cross boundaries and do cross various backgrounds and ethnicities, and as such carry hopefully a weight in in cultural diplomacy. Um, you know, I, I won't sort of um, dwell so long, but, you know, my work on in, in, in the environment has spanned now over uh, two decades. Um, first, uh, starting up um, um, with a, a, I would say, a journey, um, setting up the first um, WWF office in the Middle East, so doing an environmental NGO, working on various issues in the UAE. Um, then heading up the Environment Agency, which is the largest regulator in, in the region working on, as you said, um, quite diverse set of issues from um, a regulating industry to, um, you know, and, and a diverse set uh, of, of industries, oil and gas, but also traditional industries such as farming and fishing as well, and also operating and managing protected areas, but also being a scientific authority on issues such as um, air quality, marine water quality, and climate change. So very, very, very diverse set of issues. But I have to say, when watching the film, I just wanted to say what the film represents, I think, to many people working in this, uh, in, in my field or in this sector, it's just this once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, really seeing an animal going from an animal that's categorized as extinct um, really? in the wild, uh, you know, to an animal yeah. now thriving. And I, I, you know, and I hope you'll ask me how many numbers are there now in the wild. <laughs> it's just a, a, a conservationist dream. And having the privilege and the honor to be given this opportunity is is really a dream come true. That's fantastic. Um, I just want to say your, your work is exceptionally important, uh, and it's particularly important to us in, in public diplomacy uh, and cultural diplomacy, because you know we've we've known for a very long time that uh, Emiratis and the Emirates, uh, a government, have been very very interested and concerned about the environment. Uh, and, you know, in, in in spite of what um, perhaps stereotypes say. Uh, and there's always been an interest in maintaining a balance between development and, and the environment. There's also an appreciation because the environment here is in our region is so harsh that whatever animal and, and, and plant life you have needs to be preserved. Otherwise, you know, where are you? Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little more about uh, species conservation and why now you're involved in, in uh, Mohammed Zayed Species Con Conservation Fund? What was the thinking behind that? Uh, and, and what other species do you look at? So, you know, you know, very right to say that um, that conservation is not a new ethos for us in the Emirates. It's something yeah. that um, w has been a very much a part and parcel of, I would say, almost a national identity. Yeah. Um, and personally, that's why and how I got interested in uh, the environment and conservation. It was uh, not just about the species. But what the environment and animals and plants that, as you said, you know, we so depended on, depended on, um, yeah. represented in a sort of national cultural identity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about our national identity, and we can't divorce that from the founder of the UAE, 
yeah. who amazingly, 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 not only had this incredible moral empathy towards you know, a diverse set of backgrounds and ethnicities. I mean, he was the greatest diplomat, um, but he had and he extended this empathy also to animals, to species, to even plants. And there are countless stories um, where Sheikh Zayed uh, stepped in and almost, um, you know, enveloped this voice of nature um, mm -hmm. um, um, in, in our region, but, uh, but not just for our region, but also um, for the world. And I'm extremely proud that these values um, were then institutionalized in institutions like the Environment Agency and now the institution that I lead, which is the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. And we work, of course, on species conservation. We don't discriminate between big animals, yeah. small animals, insects, plants. And uh, we work in more than 160 countries um, across the world. Um, so, so, so that is, is I think, um, um, an incredible value, and I think it also represents one of the reasons, or that defines um, why we have succeeded uh, so well in the UAE in our development path, because throughout our development, um, um, I can say that the environment was not an afterthought; it was very much part and parcel of our development, and and of course our success. And uh, to push you a little further on that point, um, it, it is very much a part of the values of the Emirates, and it is very much related to uh, the way in which Sheikh, Sheikh Zayed uh, um, uh, looked at the world. And that's part of, what, uh, part of the reason why we have the Sir Banias uh, Island, which I hope you can tell us about as well. Um, but can you also explain uh, how, uh, because in a way we have a new generation of Emiratis who are not necessarily completely in tune with the, the older type uh, traditional values. Uh, you know, the, the Emirati who spends more time in, in a built up world. How are we connecting them with, with those values? Now, I don't think this is unique to Emiratis, but potentially sure. uh, unique to a, a new generation um, that you know, like you said, are, are becoming increasingly urbanized, um, very separate uh, from, from nature. And I think it's, you know, it's really critical that institutions like the Environment Agency and the Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund um, do their utmost to, to start working on reconnecting. Um, 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 and not in, and not, it's not just like I said, the new generation, but in general, yeah us people living in cities are, are essentially divorced from, from nature. So there yeah. needs to be a reckon, uh, we need to reconcile this. Um, we need to go to, uh, um, to counselors that are able to kind of bridge and, and, and provide the bridge um, for both, uh, for people into nature. And mm -hmm. that, that, yeah. is, that is really, and really important and critical because for a very long time, um, conservationists and, and scientists, um, when they work on issues on, of, of nature and particularly species conservation, um, we tend to be quite selfish. We tend mm -hmm. to say, look, the best thing for nature is to keep people away from it. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and we would you know, not necessarily communicate about the work that we do. Um, we uh, don't necessarily um, facilitate movement into protected areas. And I think um, um, we are now challenged by this methodology and this approach. Um, we are now moving towards um, opening up um, mm -hmm. and, and using, you know, different media such as film, such as the film that we just all, all mm -hmm. watch to um, start reaching various audiences and not, not necessarily just, you know, to keep speaking to ourselves, scientists mm -hmm. speaking mm -hmm. to ourselves and so forth. Uh, that's fascinating because, uh, you know, I was going to ask you also about that, the, the fact that you've uh, managed to keep a very low profile in, in, a, in a certain sense. Uh, and, you know, I, I was speaking to you and, and your husband about this issue about a year ago, and I was really, really surprised at the number of initiatives that have been uh, that have taken place. Uh, and now, you know, you've, you've clarified as to why you would uh, you might want to keep that under wraps. Um, but I suppose it doesn't really help my next question, which is, you know, how, how <laughs> Emiratis love to travel and people in the Emirates love to travel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could link up, you know, the, the travel to 160 countries with visits to these different sites to, to, to see what the Emirates is actually doing right across the board? Uh, absolutely. I mean, when I speak to youth across the UAE, I had a wonderful session, I think, uh, you know, almost a week ago when we engaged on this very topic, you know, what is, what are the barriers um, to entry into nature? Um, there's yeah. a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of information, there's plenty of documentaries, but what's, yeah. um, what are those barriers? 
And sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's local authorities and NGOs just providing very practical information. How do yeah. I get to a protected area? Is it sure. open? Um, do I have access? When I get to it, what can I do? What should I not do? But mm -hmm. also, interestingly, it was a two-way route because we sort of also spoke to them to say, what do you expect to do in nature? Um, is it mm -hmm. your traditional bird watchers? And it was interesting and I think fascinating because what I've learned is we also need to speak across disciplines. So not yeah. just speak to those who are, you know, the bird watchers, which are, of course, an amazing group and are welcome in our protected <laughs> areas. Yes. But there are the artists that want to take inspiration from nature. There are yeah. the poets that continue to take inspiration from nature. There are the yogis that want to practice yoga in nature. And mm -hmm. there are therapists that want to take their sessions into nature. So there's yeah. a variety of different types of people and I, that, that would be interested. Our role as NGOs and governments is mm -hmm. to, facilitate, um, um, uh, this, to facilitate this entry and mm -hmm. this interest. And so mm -hmm. I'm really happy to kind of say for those who are in attendance, we, we are trying to do that. We, we established a program, the Emirates Nature, um, which is a local uh, environmental NGO that is associated with WWF, um, mm -hmm. with the support of the Environment Agency, um, has established a new uh, a program called Connect with Nature. Excellent. And it is doing just that. Fantastic. So um, look it up and, uh, and uh, go and explore. Excellent. Um, again, back to children and how they deal with these these matters. Um, when I was a child, I used to love all kinds. Of, I used to be a bird watcher up until the age of about ten, and then I got you know a little more uh, uh, a little shy and decided not to do that anymore. But um, the kids are so fascinated by by animals. Kids are so fascinated by trips to the zoo. Um, you know, would you think of maybe taking some of the work that you do and kind of packaging it in a way that you can tap into that innate interest that children have uh, and bring it into the schools and, 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 you know, sort of capture some of that, that interest as opposed to allowing the interest to die out, to connect what you guys are doing with what's actually uh, in, in the schools? Absolutely, Omar. It's just so critical to um, to fulfill the appetite, because like you said, yeah. you know, we're all born with this innate appetite and uh, connection to nature. Hmm. And then as as we grow, unfortunately, some of us don't have necessarily the opportunity to continue this journey in nature because we live in cities and nature is becoming so difficult to get to and mm -hmm. almost exclusive. Um, you know, and so those are the kind of things that, as you rightly said, need to be need to be broken and facilitated mm -hmm. um, people need to get to it and and not just learn about it through documentaries you know somebody once told me somebody incredible once told me to to know something you gotta go you yeah. have to go and see it for yourself you have to touch yeah. it you have to smell it you have to use your senses and be you know be in it you know there's yeah. this great yeah. biologist um edward o wilson that yes. um you know that of course started this incredible theory that i very much believe in believe in called biophilia and mm -hmm. biophilia is this notion that all of us you know have this natural affiliation to what is natural yeah um and so we need to go back to that similar to when we what we see in the story i mean these oryx um you know that represent obviously an an, an iconic species um, yeah. um uh, of arid and semi-arid ecosystems you know even though they came from different countries um, they finally get, got to got to Chad and we were all worried, you know, everybody, you know, typing, you know, putting in numbers and and trying to understand what was going to happen. But it was incredible. Nature kicks in. It does. Yes. You know, they just they just they just sort of um, are, are doing well. They're extremely resilient. And it just shows that animals may be similar to people. All we need is, you know, a little we need peace. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we yes. need a space and we need food. Yeah. Um, and, you know, once you give these, uh, um, uh, these species, those three variables or, or key variables, they, they mm -hmm. survive and, and, and they thrive. Um, and so, so that's just important for us to also recognize. So how, do you, how do you look at Chad and then say, how, how can we avoid uh, another form of extinction? I mean, yeah, because uh, just I was watching the video and I had to leave the video at the point where the poachers came in. Uh, and poaching is, you know, it's an, it's an attractive sport for a lot of people. Uh, and particularly in areas where there's uh, immense poverty. Is there a balance that needs to be maintained between you know, human need and uh, the need to preserve? You know, it's, you can't have 
environmental justice and protection mm. without environment without social justice or economic justice i mean you know it all yeah. has to kind of go hand in hand and yeah. you know so if, for example in this project it's not just a project about um reintroducing the scimitar horned oryx it's a project mm. about you know international cooperation between yeah. governments and international uh international institutions but you know more importantly you know it's it's a, it's a project about the local community um, you yeah. know, how do we engage with the local communities and provide jobs within this, within within the protected areas? You know, a lot right. of them have uh, have been engaged now as as rangers, so so that so that the um, the 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 success of the project, you know, reflects on the community's success as well, both socially right. and economically. So there are social and economic uh, benefits and knock-on effects to to the community as well. Yeah? That's key. You will not have a successful conservation project or a protected area without a, not, a social economic and, 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 and economic um, yeah. uh, return for the community. You need, right. you need all three. Yeah, yeah. And so if we look at the Species Fund uh, as, a, as a kind of a global venture, uh, one of the questions that came to mind um, in preparation for this talk was, how do you choose which species you will attempt to, you know, sort of preserve and, and strengthen? Uh, do you go by geographical location, by you know, sort of the team, the proposal behind it? Um, do you do you actually um, take on projects that are your own projects, or are you are you funding other people's projects? Can you explain a so, bit of the process? Yeah, of course. So for the MBZ fund, it's uh, it's it, it's quite a sort of um, um, I would say not very um, uh, traditional in the way we choose uh, our projects. Um, yeah. We've we came in kind of saying that we're going to do three things. We're going to mm -hmm. get uh, funding to individuals. Um, not necessarily institutions, so we almost mm -hmm. Uberize this notion of, of, of conservation mm -hmm. um, because of this great belief in the individual. You know, institutions are, of course, very strong and historic and visionary and provide the, the framework. But if you don't have mm -hmm. those individuals pushing for a particular species, the species mm -hmm. will, will not survive, um, regardless of how much money you put into it. So the idea was, you know, it's it support the individuals the to second find a champion, yeah? exactly finding right. the champions mm -hmm. um the second thing was getting um funding to those champions as quickly and effectively as possible so there's a lot of of, of challenge within the conservation world of getting funding number one mm -hmm. but also the how to streamline it so yeah. the the mbz species uh, uh platform streamlined that whole process from the mm -hmm. day a champion uh, puts in an application for a grant to mm -hmm. the time he actually collects the grant if approved it's mm -hmm. um it's it's a maximum of three months wow. um which is again very 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 unique and the yeah. third one is we actually um fund the uh, species and the programs that many other institutions do not fund so we don't fund the things that are sexy and fun and you know, yeah. um, we actually find those that are actually um, much less known. We yeah. do a lot of work on 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 insects and and butterflies and fungi and uh, yeah. and so so along of course the, with 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 the other larger mammals. Um, so we we fund a, a wide uh, variety of different types of taxonomic groups. So can I ask you about that? Because um, it, this has come up in other conversations I've had about His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin, bin Zayed, the, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, uh, is that he focuses in, in a certain way, he tends to focus on the really neglected areas of life. So whether it's neglected individuals, neglected diseases, uh, and, and now neglected species. Uh, can you explain where that thinking is coming from? I mean, it's wonderful to know that somebody is trying to fill, fill that gap. I mean, I think it stems from um, from w perhaps an approach that's not necessarily looking for a uh, you know to be personally associated um, yeah. with with some of these causes, but really looking at where is the greatest need, and yeah. um, and and from a philanthropy perspective, you know, this is a wonderful match because um, a lot of the perhaps or many philanthropies sometimes focus on some of the issues that already have been handled by many other institutions where the niche is quite competitive. 
Um, yeah. So what I so perhaps it's choosing a particular niche, like you said, that's neglected is the reason why um, his mm -hmm. personal philanthropy is 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 uh, is moving uh, um, is focusing on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, can we talk a bit about um, the the Emirates and the, the Arabian Peninsula? Because I mean, there, there have been over over the last uh, few decades uh, questions about um, different kinds of species um, going into extinction, and you know the link between hunting uh, and and extinction. So there was a big big issue about the hibara, for example, which I believe in English is the buster, which is you know sort of a favorite target for for uh, falcon hunting. Um, and yet the Emirates, uh, even though passionate about falcon hunting, has also set up a, a, a breeding center and, and uh, scientific centers to uh, preserve the hibara. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe you can uh, also correct me with this fact, but, um, but, you know, I was told that the first international conference that was ever uh, organized in the UAE mm -hmm. um, was in 1976. Mm -hmm. And that was, interestingly enough, a conference about environment. It was really? the first internationally international uh, Falcon uh, conference. That's a problem. So, I, I hope that's true. I'll double check, and then I'm going to use that in in other talks. And and if you do find out, please let me know if that is true. <laughs> I will. But what I but what I what what but what I know is true for a fact. It was the first international conference on falconry yeah. conservation. Um, and so that tells you a little, it, uh, it tells you, Ahmed, like what I've said before, is this notion and this value of conservation is, is one that has very much um, mm -hmm. um, captured the minds and the hearts of the leadership very, very er early on. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. issue of falconry, like I, you know, is not just an issue of, of species and its, uh, you know, and its prey, the hubara, uh, yeah. you know, going, going um, it, with its numbers uh, declining. It's also about the art of falconry, the tradition of falconry. Of course, so yeah. it's also, you know, understood that if you know the hobara goes uh, extinct, then so will falconry, and if falconry yeah. goes extinct, then we lose a little part of our heritage and our mm -hmm. culture. But the idea is sometimes not all culture and heritage and tradition is good. Um, mm -hmm. So then, how do you, you know, when you have the means and the ability? To ensure that your activities aren't harmful, how do you um, how how do you reform? Mm -hmm. And very early on, this notion of ensuring that um, falcons aren't captured from the wild, um, so ensuring that we do captive breeding for falcons, ensuring mm -hmm. that we in, in, invest in uh, in in the breeding of habara, and so on and so forth. So it's um, it's a beautiful story of 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 not only conservation but also. Um, also cultural diplomacy. Yeah, I, you know, to be honest, I didn't think about that bit. Um, it, there's a whole culture around uh, falcon hunting um, and uh, the number of young men who pride themselves on the way they take care of their falcons uh, is, is, is amazing. Um, somebody uh, has said, what are the number of oryxes in Chad? So I hope you're gonna reveal to us. So what I did, did want to say, what I, you know, what's great about this project is the fact that from the beginning, we wanted to go at scale. So we weren't going to introduce one or two species, uh, I mean, one or two oryx, wait for a few years and introduce yeah. a few more. From the beginning, because we had the right partners, and this I've yeah. learned uh, over my, uh, you know, during my uh, career, is when you have the right partners, yeah. seize the opportunity. From uh -huh. the beginning, go yeah. big. And so That's the vision cool. from the beginning was to introduce 500. Uh -huh. And today, there are 288 uh, scimitar horned oryx roaming uh -huh. free in their protected area um, in Chad. And just sort of, in, you know, for context uh, sake, the protected yeah. area in Chad is larger than the Emirates of Abu Dhabi. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. There yeah. are 28 who, who were able to go there before the pandemic. So uh -huh. they, are, they are there waiting to be released. Yes. And so that makes a total of, of my math is not very good, but 301. 301. And uh, oh. happy mm -hmm. to also report that we've had good births. So, uh, so far we have uh, 33 new calves um, that were born in, in Chad uh, only this year. So from mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, and we expect 50 more, bringing a total to around 80. And so you're tracking every single one of these orgs? Uh, we are um, through our partners. Um, yeah. We have uh, the uh, 
Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute who right. are um, uh, tracking those individuals, but also we've got people on the ground um, right. um, from, um, from various uh, uh, institutions. Um, we've got the you know, Zoological Society of London that are tracking yeah. them through, through satellite and are actually there on the ground, as well as our partner NGO, the Saharan uh, Conservation Fund, and of course, the government of, of, of Chad. Who I have to say have been have been just incredible. I mean, yeah. this project is 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 very high on their agenda. You know, all the way to the president, um, um, everybody's kind of watching this project, tracking the oryx, and and ensure and hoping that it will inspire many many more conservation programs. So, as a, um, a an employee of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'm also very interested in uh, the way in which this um, environmental ecological species. Uh, diplomacy affects our relationship with the government itself. So, I mean, Chad is one government with which uh, you've been working, um, but there are, you say, 160 countries where we're doing this work. Are there any other countries that where, where there's uh, something of such significance? Uh, many. I mean, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed has an Arabian Oryx introduction program, and we've okay. been introducing Arabian Oryx in the Arabian Peninsula, in Saudi, in Oman, in ah. Jordan. Um, we've been doing a lot of work, of course, uh, the whole falconry, uh, we, yeah. you know, instead of the silk route, we call it the falconry route, um, yeah. engaging with uh, the various countries along the uh, migratory path of falcons from China to Mongolia to Kazakhstan to Kyrgyzstan and so forth. So <laughs> a lot of those uh, countries, uh, a lot, a lot of governments that have been working with hand in hand with the government of the UAE on conservation programs. Well, wow, fantastic. Maybe we can invite you to join us in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, have a have a huge department for uh... <laughs> for green diplomacy. For or green South diplomacy. diplomacy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Diala Nusheba, who I believe you know and I know, um, yeah. asks you what you've learned from your friendship with Jane Goodall, who is the primatologist. Wow. Um, yeah. Didn't expect that question. I was uh, yeah. sort of nice, nice but, big uh, question out of nowhere. Thanks, thanks, thank you, Diana. Diana. <laughs> I always know how to put me on the spot. Yeah. Um, what have I learned? I've learned this incredible uh, um, uh, value of humbleness. I mean, mm. what Dr. Jane Goodall has been able to achieve in her career is just mm -hmm. incredible. Um, for those who who may not know, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Jane Goodall um, sort of coined a new approach of how we uh, um, uh, understand uh, chimpanzees and their relationship to, yeah. uh, to humans. So, I mean, incredible person, um, but incredibly humble. And she has the, the tact to, to, to be able to communicate um, effectively to a three-year-old um, with this incredible sort of, um, uh, you, know, you know, with, 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 with respect, and, and at the same time, have this wonderful prose to be able to, be able to speak to leaders. She had mm -hmm. the opportunity to speak in, for example, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed's uh, um, Ramadan Majlis series. Yeah. And, and, you know, speaking to, you know, very um, influential individuals from, from the UAE. And, she, you know, she was equally able to inspire, inspire, inspire those in the audience. Mm -hmm. So I would say her humbleness, obviously her intelligence, but mm -hmm. her ability to, to communicate from the heart um, yeah. um, about uh, uh, the plight of, of the environment. And uh, she can be brutally honest at times as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's always uh, fun. Um, I wanted to also understand, uh, you know, because I think this this field is actually very uh, a very powerful field. It's one that can really change mentalities, and and again, come back to the idea of more more films, uh, more exposure around these issues, and more interaction with with young men and women at at, at schools and universities, um, because yeah, I think being aware and sort of sensitive to the environment actually will, will changes the perspective and changes the, the kind of the mentality that that uh, we we may be falling into with this uh, huge consumerism push. Um, can you can you give us an idea of what, what you're doing in terms of uh, well what what potential there is for further films to come out, further documentaries, more interaction with the schools? Look, I mean, um, I think to a certain extent, this uh, pan pandemic 
has uh, has perhaps um, forced us to re-examine yeah. our relationship um, with nature. Um, yeah. You know, understanding ultimately the source of of the problem was actually our mistreatment of of nature and animals, yeah. and uh, and uh, that essentially um, was was really the source. So so yeah. so this pandemic perhaps is 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 an opportunity to reflect. Yeah. And as you said, it's an opportunity to think about, you know, you know, what happens after the pandemic? Will we go back to business as usual? Um, yeah. Are we rethinking the way we consume um, and how we consume? Can we do it more ethically? Um, can we do it in a way that's much more respectful uh, to nature? Yeah. And I think these are really good, good questions. And I and, you know, again, having the opportunity to speak to the um, Emirati youth uh, last week in the youth majlis. Um, yeah. I felt that there was such an appetite for that um, yeah. from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, as well as from a consumer perspective. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very excited, not only to travel that. again, but to actually, you know, see what <laughs> happens after COVID from a, from a, from an approach to nature and and um, and. Uh, our various, you know, exactly from our, you know, in terms of our approach to nature. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, question, that's, uh, it's a question that's come up in quite a, quite a few of our, our discussions, you know, both privately and, and, and in public, uh, whether COVID will lead to a real change in kind of approach and mentality, or whether we will actually go back to what we were doing and, you know, do it even, even worse than uh, we've done it so far. Uh, I think if you, if you give me the opportunity, I think that there's a great opportunity to actually grab hold of this and start pushing. Um, a lot of people will want to go back to normal, but a lot of kids out there and a lot of young people, I believe, maybe even a couple of people my age, will actually be interested in seeing if you can take the momentum uh, and take the kind of the glaring, glaring uh, position of COVID uh, and make something better out of it. So I'm, I'm very excited to be able to, to, to work with you uh, on, on further um, opportunities if, if you're up for it. Uh, I'm, I'm up for it. On the spot. I'm up for it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, is, is there anything else you think we should know about? Is there any, are there any secret uh, projects that the Species Conservation Fund is working on that, that uh, you want to reveal? Plenty of projects, um, you know. Um, no, I think Ahmed, we've 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 spoken. I think we are uh, approaching the end of our time. So I also don't want to infringe on your time and those I, of the audience. <laughs> I'm at your service, but I would like to thank you for for really a, a wonderful discussion, uh, and hopefully we can uh, really pick this up in the next few uh, weeks and and years. Uh, to see what else we can do in terms of raising awareness about these issues uh, and raising awareness about the work that uh, you know very quiet institutions in the Emirates are, are ca carrying out. Uh, so thank you very much again. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for participating.